Uh, all right, let's start off with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity, this beautiful, sunny day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here in this place, and we ask that you would shine your light into our lives in this time. Open our heart and our lives and our spirits to your spirit and your words of love and life and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, we are in this great sending series. Uh, we're talking about uh, God is ascending God. He sends Jesus to us, but he also sends us to go out. And last week, or two weeks ago actually, we talked about being a step ahead, that we all are a step ahead of someone at some point that needs to know what we know. Last week, we talked about being a step alongside, that we go together. We are uh, fellow workers, fellow soldiers, fellow prisoners. We are in this and on this journey together. The task for the week last week was to be the seed in good soil. Be the good soil. Allow God's word to work in you to produce a hundredfold or more. And the question of the week, what does it mean to be heirs together? What does it mean that we are heirs not only with each other, but heirs with Christ? Of eternity, of life, that we inherit all that he has inherited. Did anyone have any comments or thoughts on that over the last week? Yes, Sonia. Me, being his heir means that someday I'm going to be in heaven with him. I'm going to see him and talk to him and walk with him. So, so to be a co-heir, to be a sue-heir, mean that, means that we are going to be in heaven with him. Yes, good, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Bill. We don't have to earn it. And we don't have to earn it, yes. And we talked about that last week. There's nothing we can do to earn it. It is Christ that has done it all for us, right? Okay. So let me ask you this. Uh, what does, if I gave you the, the letters T-M-I, what do the letters T-M-I mean to you? Too much information, right? I don't want to know. I, well, uh, don't tell me. Too many details, too many personal details, right? But we live in this world where it's not just those personal details. There's, we have information overload. There is simply too much information, and we can't handle it, handle it all. In 1982... Buckminster Fuller uh, created this uh, thing that he called the, the knowledge doubling curve. And he estimated that it, at about the year 1900, for the first however many thousands of years, that knowledge doubled about every hundred years. In 1982, that was, he, he estimated that knowledge was doubling at the rate of about every 12 to 13 months. And the most recent estimates are that in 2020, knowledge was doubling at the rate of every 11 to 12 hours. So twice a day, the amount of information in the world doubles. That's way too much information. We can't handle it, but what, well, we get used to it, and we, we're trying to handle it, and we're becoming a little bit more accustomed to it. We, I have conversations all the time with people, and we're talking about stuff, and somebody say, well, I don't know. Everybody pulls out their phones and Googles it, right? Uh, you know, there's, there's a, the information is there. We can find it if we can just rely on the technology, of course, right? but we become less and less confident. In fact, we, we qualify everything as like what I did as I was talking about that before. The latest information I have is, but we have a half-life of information these days too. What was good information a year ago is no longer as valuable now, or it may be even a lesser half-life. And the information that we look for, that we, we choose certain directions, 
Some people choose the left-wing propaganda, and some people choose the, the right-wing twist on the truth. And that's all we look to. We don't look to both sides, and what we end up with is a very divided nation. And you look at our world today, and we see that. We choose the information we want, and we ignore the rest, no matter what side you're on. We've got to look at all the information. We need information that we can trust. It seems like anybody with a website and a couple of facts, and people come storming to them. But there is one truth. We, as Christians, know that truth. God's word, the Bible, is the truth. And no matter what truths we hear in the world around us, no matter what information is out there, we can look at that truth. We talk about being a step ahead, that we are a step ahead of somebody, and we're stepping alongside of others. And, and tonight we're going to talk about, our message title is, A Step Behind. You see, in this amazing world of so much information, we need someone to guide us. Yes, we are a step behind or a step ahead of, of somebody, but we're also a step behind somebody. We need somebody to take us by the hand and bring us along. We need to have a teacher. We need a rabbi. We need to be disciples. And, and unfortunately, the, we get this mentality so often that, that there's, there's, it, it's embarrassing not to know. But we need to recognize that being a disciple is okay. Not knowing it all is okay. But we need some sort of spiritual mentor. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, and I have, I, okay, good. So I haven't lost you completely yet. Rachel, okay, good. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, we look at Moses and Joshua. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. There are people that God puts in our lives. Joshua had Moses in his life to guide him, to bring him along. Moses didn't say, oh, you look like a nice guy to, to lead next. I'll pick you. God put Moses in Joshua's path. And God there also says, the, or Moses says, the Lord will lead you. Be strong and courageous. The Lord's going to lead you. He'll put someone in your path. God puts people in our paths. God put Pastor Winter in my path. And he, and, and he had this place for, he was a pastor here for 40 some years. And then he put Pastor Bowl here to help prepare this place for me. And he put things in my life to prepare me for this place. God works with people in our lives and he works to put people to prepare us and to prepare the place for us. And he does the same for you. It's not just something that God does for pastors. God puts people in your path to lead you, to guide you, to disciple you. We need to be strong and courageous and look for those moments that God has prepared for us. Like Joseph in, uh, and his brothers, as Joseph's in Egypt in Genesis chapter 45. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. 
Joseph, this is after decades of, of slave, being enslaved and being in prison. And Joseph is saying, it's okay because God sent me here to save lives. God put me in a place for you. God puts people in our lives to prepare us, to guide us, to teach us. Even Jesus had someone to prepare the way for him. We know John the Baptist in Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. Now, obviously, Jesus was not John's disciple, but John was preparing the way for Jesus. There are people here who are here to lead us and to guide us and to bring us along to where we need to be, to disciple us, to teach us what we need to do. And we need to be humble enough to recognize that sometimes we need a guide. But that's not always easy, following in someone's path. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus goes before us and he says, This is the way you need to do it. Take up your cross and follow me. It's not going to be a lot of fun all the time. I know that there are TV preachers out there who, who will say, yes, God just wants to bless your socks off. And, and yes, he does want to bless your socks off, but eternally. Not necessarily here. Sometimes life's just going to stink. Sometimes life is going to be rough. But God put Jesus in our lives to go before us, to prepare for us that eternal place from our gospel reading today in John chapter 14. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also." Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm going, I've, I'm, I'm going to hang on the cross. This was before he died. I'm going to hang on the cross, I'm going to rise, and I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. Jesus is preparing the way for us. And he puts people in our lives to help us. And we need to look at this not only as an eternal thing, but as a now thing. This is a, a now kind of preparation. He goes to prepare the place, but we are still here. There are things that need to be accomplished. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes from our first reading here this, morning, this evening. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Yes, we have that eternal home. We have that, that house, uh, that home not made with hands. But we also have this tent, our earthly home. We need to think not only about eternity, but we need to think about the here and now. We need to think about becoming the people that God calls us to be. We need to think about being the disciples, to learn, to understand, and to grow in God in the way God would have us live. And to share his word. And again, going back to our gospel, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In this deeply divided world that we live in, the only truth is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That is the only thing we can count on. And when we study God's word, when we look into that as the, the truth, and not the truth of the world, then we become the disciples that God calls us to be. And we need people to guide us in that, in that journey. And it's not just pastors. There are plenty of people that can guide you in your faith journey. To hold you accountable. To read with you. To study God's word with you. It doesn't have to be just a pastor. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, 
that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, who for their sake died and was raised. This is, this is not the, the final chapter in our story that was written. This is simply a chapter. And it's not that this chapter is unimportant. It's not that you are unimportant, but you are an important part. You are an important character in that chapter that God has written for you. Throughout the story of history, God has an important part for you to play, and we need to understand your, our parts to play, and we need to understand that, that we need to live not for ourselves, but we need to live for him who died for us. We need to live for Jesus, and that means following him and understanding and being a disciple. Now, I understand that we can, as I said in the children's message, we can follow the wrong people. And, and there are plenty of, uh, of examples throughout the Bible that uh, people followed the wrong person. Um, uh, when Moses was on the Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments, Aaron listened to the people and he built the golden calf and he, they led the, him astray. And then when the, the, uh, the children of Israel were looking at going into the promised land, they sent the 12 spies, and 10 of them came back and said, no, 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 don't go there. And it cost the children of Israel 40 years of wandering in the desert. And then Rehoboam, when he was the son of Solomon, and, and when he listened to the young bucks rather than the old geezers who had the wisdom, when he listened to the young people, cost the kingdom, and the kingdom was divided. And then we look at the one that has affected all of us from the beginning, of, from creation, not the beginning of creation, but in creation, in Genesis chapter 3. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat, it, eat of it all the days of your life. Now there are, first of all, I want you to understand, I'm not talking about, men. you should not listen to your wife. That's not what I'm saying at all. Okay? But the point of this is, sometimes even those people we love and we trust can lead us astray. And we need to, we need to uh, look at everything that somebody is telling it in respect to God's word. God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of that tree. And if Adam had told Eve, no, that's not what God said, things might have turned out a little different. We need to look at those we choose to lead us and guide us, those who we choose to allow to disciple us. Even pastors can sometimes lead people astray. We, we look at the, uh, at, at the Reformation and Martin Luther, and, and Luther looked at the, the, the priests at that time, how they were leading people astray. And Luther said that, that one of the critical roles of the church is to know your scriptures so well that you can be sure whether the pastor is telling you the truth or not. Whether the pastor is leading you astray, that's your job to know your Bible well enough to know when I'm speaking the truth. That's your job. And it's a critical job. But that truth, that truth of God's word is revealed to us by God's Holy Spirit. In John 14, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Spirit guides us about the truth of God's word. The Spirit opens God's word to us and reveals the truth of Jesus' death and his resurrection of, of our forgiveness and our life everlasting. That's the Spirit who gives us that. And the Spirit is our guide. He guides us through tr to all truth. Again in John 15, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, 
he will bear witness about me. Jesus is saying the critical thing about the Holy Spirit is that he reveals Jesus to the world. But then let's look at the next verse as well. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. You and I are called not only to, 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 uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to bear witness, but we are also called to bear witness of the good news of Jesus Christ, to become the disciples that God has called us to be. Now, as I was preparing for this message, I came across this phrase, and the phrase is ontological change. Can anybody tell me what, oh, that was really small. Um, and that's my mistake, obviously. Um, but uh, anybody tell me what ontological change means? I didn't know it either. So don't worry about it. I had to look it up. Ontology is the study of being. So ontological change is changing from one thing, being one thing, to being another thing. That is what we are called to be. We are called to grow as we are discipled. We are called to follow and learn and change who we are because God has created us to be something different. We are called to change who we are. And not of our own power but again by the power of the Holy Spirit to follow and understand who God has made us to be, to share the good news of Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life, to understand more every day what it means to be loved by a God who sacrificed himself for us, to be, to be changed by a God who wants us to live in heaven with him forever. We are called to be new every day. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The process of being a disciple is not an overnight change. We talk about the, the butterfly and that metamorphosis, and, and that that's all often seems so, so radical and so instantaneous, but, but we are called in a lifetime of change to be discipled for our entire lives. God puts people in our path to teach us and guide us, to disciple us, put Jesus in our path to prepare the way but he also puts others in our lives. He moves in our lives, and he prepares us for others as well. As we look for the truth of God's word in what other people are telling us, we need to look for the truth of Jesus, his work on the cross, his victory over death from the grave, and recognize that God has a future for all of us, and he will guide us. And we can be strong and be courageous, just as Moses told Joshua. Okay, thoughts, comments, questions? Okay, here's your task for the week then. Embrace being a disciple. Don't be embarrassed because you don't know. Simply embrace the learning process. Embrace being a disciple. And the question of the week, who do you look to for guidance? Certainly we should look to Jesus. Certainly we should look and trust that God is guiding us. But, but who here as a human do you look for guidance from? Do you test what they say against the truth of God's word? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for moving and working in our lives. We thank you for those people who, have, who you have placed in our lives to guide us, to teach us. We thank you most of all for Jesus who came before us to go and prepare a place for us. We thank you that because he went before we can follow. We can, we can 
come more close to understanding you every day and we can be in heaven with you someday forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Matt, if you